mysteries, unique history, unanswered science, baffling true crime, cryptids, the strange and unusual can all be found here. So come out of the rain and follow us across the creaking floor through the secret passage into the realm behind the bookcase. All right, welcome back, everybody. Thanks for joining us here on Behind the Bookcase. Uh, today, we are going to go over some mysterious objects. And um, we're going to surprise each other, I think, today. So you pulled a mysterious object. I pulled a mysterious object. We don't know what we're going to talk about. We'll discover it together and maybe along with some of you. So I'm going to pass it off to Aaron. You want to jump in and get us started? Sure. So my mysterious object um, is called the <laughs> the dodecahedron. Ooh. It's an ancient Roman object. Um, and the article that I'm going to go through is from Mental Floss by Tom Metcalf. Metcalf, sorry. Um, so uh, the... The article begins uh, with a gentleman named Brian Campbell. Um, in 1987, he was refilling the hole left by a tree stump in his yard in Romford, East London, when his shovel struck something metal. He leaned down and pulled the object from the soil, wondering at its strange shape. The object was small, smaller than a tennis ball, and caked with a heavy clay. My first impressions, Campbell tells Mental Floss, were it were beautifully and skillfully made, probably by a blacksmith as a measuring tool of sorts. Campbell placed the object on his kitchen windowsill, where it sat for the next 10 or so years. Wow. Then he visited the Roman Fort and Archaeological Park in Salzburg, Germany, and there, in a glass display case, was an almost identical object. So this is kind of like someone taking an object to the Antiques Roadshow. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. And discovering that they actually have something. Yeah, um, like, this has been on my kitchen windowsill for all these years. Um, so yeah, he realized that his garden surprise was a Roman dodecahedron, a 12-sided metal mystery that has baffled archaeologists for centuries. Although dozens and perhaps hundreds of explanations have been offered to account for the, the dodecahedron, no one is certain just what they were used for. So I'm going to go through some of the theories, okay? Sounds good. The first Roman dodecahedron to intrigue archaeologists was found almost 300 years ago, buried in a field in the English countryside along with some ancient coins piece of mixed metal or ancient brass consisting of 12 equal sides, read the description of the egg size object when it was presented to the Society of Antiquaries in London in 1739. The 12 faces had an equal number of perforations within them, or holes, and all of them were of unequal diameters, but opposite to one another. Every facing had a knob or little ball fixed to it. The antiquarians were flummoxed by the finely crafted metal shell and what its purpose may have been. Um, so the article goes on to kind of say that hundred or so similar ob objects have been found and pretty much none of them are exactly the same size. And were these found in the same location or different locations? Um, yeah, they are actually all from a similar location, um, but they are um, they're, they're found throughout Europe. But I'll get into exactly kind of the range because I think that is important. Okay. Um, <clears throat> uh, they so the the different ones they they range in size from a golf ball. Uh, to a, a little bit larger than a baseball. Um, other than that, they're they're the same. They're all with the twelve sides, of course. You know, 
the dodecahedron as always, but every hole um, varies in diameter. And the inside of it's not solid; it's it's literally an, a a shell, so it's it's hollow in the middle. Um, and so they're on display all over the place because so many have been found. Um, now yeah. the picture I'm looking at that you just showed me, um, the twelve sides have glass with um, metal kind of connecting these glass pieces. Do they all look like that, or are some of them only metal? It's not actually glass. If you look at it, it's just uh, open. It uh, looks gotcha. almost like glass, but it's gotcha. it's just open. Like you could put your fingers in it. Gotcha. Okay. Right. Mm -hmm. um, so um, going back to um, to theories, um, basically they have uh, no paper trail. Historians have found no written documentation of the dodecahedrons in any historical sources. That void has encouraged dozens of competing and sometimes colorful theories about their purpose, from military banner ornaments to candle holders to props used in magic spells. The obvious craftsmanship that went into them at the time when metal objects were expensive and difficult to make has prompted many researchers to argue that they were valuable, an idea that has supported the uh, that is supported by the fact that several have been found stashed away with Roman era coins, but that still doesn't explain why they were made. So, due to the fine craftsmanship and the skill level involved, they are presuming they had to have some kind of a high purpose or was a, a object that was kept by the wealthy or scholarly or uh, yeah i mean i think it's just the fact that they were made they were crafted from metal which was expensive at the time and they're clearly i mean to make them equal sides and have these little balls on them and the perfectly cut out holes and all of that would have been something a skilled, skilled and yeah. you know because it was out of metal why would they do all that if it wasn't for something that was either really useful or you know showed status or something and that's why a lot of people gotcha think that um in the 19th century some antiquarians favored the theory that the dodecahedrons were a type of weapon perhaps a head of a mace or a metal bullet for a hand-held sling but as other scholars later pointed out even the largest of the dodecahedrons are too light to inflict much damage I mean, they're basically like a wiffle ball, right? So, like, yeah, and the one I saw has one top open. Is that, I mean, even if it wasn't, I, I can't see if I was pummeled in the head with this, uh, it doing much damage. Yeah. Unless it, it, it was at uh, vast speeds. Yeah. Um, I mean, and even, hitting me in the right temple or something. Yeah. I mean, unless one of those little like knobs on, on the corners like hit you exactly squarely somewhere, it'll put an eye out. Yeah. I mean, that's probably the worst it would do. Um, even going really fast. So we'll nix that theory. Yeah. What's next? Um, so it's, um, so weapons weren't the only items useful in a war. Amelia Spravagna, a physicist in Italy's Pavolinco di Torino, thinks the de decahedrons were used by the Roman military as a type of range finder. Ah, like Which, a sextant on land. Yeah, or, yeah, okay. something that you would look through the holes, I guess, or you would put maybe a stick in it or something. Um, in research published on the online repository in 2012, she argued that they could have been used to calculate the distance to an object of known size, such as a military banner or artillery, artillery weapon, by looking through pairs of the dodecahedron's differently sized holes until the object and the edges of the two circles in the dodecahedron aligned. Theoretically, only one set of holes for a given distance would line up, according to Spravina. That makes I'm sense. I'm not going to be able to say her name right, sorry. Um, the theory is strengthened by the fact that several of the dodecahedrons have been found at Roman military sites. Ah. Uh. She tells Mental Floss that the small little studs on the outside allow for a good grip of the object, so an expert soldier could use it in, in any condition. 
This seems plausible. So is this, do we know definitively if that's the use? No, I don't. Okay. I mean, there's no actual definitive answer from what I can find. Okay. So we're just going to go through and see what's the most plausible. All right. So okay? I like that one so far. Yeah. Um, so she finishes by saying the Roman army needed a range finder and the dodecahedron can be used as a range finder. Okay. Um, so I suppose you could say that, that it worked. I mean, whether that is a, it, its actual purpose. Are we also saying that this was of Roman origin? Was it Roman military? It's definitely Roman origin. Okay. Um, now, different people think it, you know, like this is obviously a military spin on it, but sure. um, we'll go through some other options um that might not um that might not be military related um so many modern scholars disagree with this theory um historian tibor gruel of the university of pex in hungary who reviewed the academic literature about the dodecahedrons in 2016 points out that no two Roman dodecahedrons are the same size, and none have any numerals or letters engraved on them, markings that you might expect on a mathematical instrument. In my opinion, the practical function of this object can be excluded because none of the items have any inscriptions or signs on them, Grohl tells Mental Floss. So in other words, if you were going to use this as a range finder, there would be some kind of math yeah. involved. So um, that okay. you can then say when these two line up it's x you know gotcha meters away or whatever um he points to the distribution of the objects as an important clue and this is going to go back to where you were asking where they were so they have been found across a northwestern swath of former roman empire from hungary to northern england but not in any other Roman territories, such as Italy, Spain, North Africa, or the Middle East. So is that merely dated as an era of the Roman Empire or more towards its usage? I don't know. We'll, okay. We'll, we'll think right. about that. But they, are, they have not been found in the entirety of where the Roman Empire would have been. Gotcha. So, okay. Um. So if you think about it, it's in, you know, the a northern, the northern western territories. Gotcha. Um, that lack works against the idea that the objects were military devices. If it was a tool for ranging artillery, artillery, rule says, why does it not appear all over the empire in a military context? So I think that's a good debunking of that, even though technically it worked in that respect, or could have. Um, or was a phase one type of device that was later, maybe it was just some other technology came along and made that. But you would still think, since there so many have been found, that it, even You'd if have it, seen even the it, metamorphosis yeah. of phase two, phase three, Yeah, perhaps. or Or it would have been used all across their gotcha. okay. military conquests until they didn't need it anymore or, right. or improved it or something. So okay. it's still only in those areas. So I think I think that's definitely a point to, to think about when we're thinking about these these uh, options. Um, so going away from the military, um, perhaps the dodecahedrons were used for play, not war. Some scholars have suggested that they may have been part of a child's toy like the French cup and ball game known as Bilboquet, which dates from the Middle Ages. Their shape also invites comparisons to the dice used for gambling, a common pastime in the Roman era. But most Roman dice were six-sided, smaller, and carved from solid wood, stone, or ivory. Plus, the differently sized holes on each face of the dodecahedrons makes them useless as dice. One side is always heavier than the other, so they always fall the same way. All right. Uh, here's my theory right now, folks. They had invented Dungeons and Dragons, <laughs> and the, the Decahedron is a good die for D&D. 
And it being heavier on one side just meant that the person that made it was a cheat. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> <laughs> All right, there's my conspiracy theory. <laughs> Until everybody learned what Until the Until everybody, was. <laughs> right, exactly. Um, so many scholars have suggested that the items had a special cultural significance and perhaps even a religious function for the peoples in the formerly Gaelic regions of Northern Europe. Because there again, it's in the North. Um, the 1939 discovery of a well-preserved bronze dodecahedron in Krefeld, near Germany's border with the Netherlands, lends credence to this idea. The object was found in the 4th century grave of a wealthy woman, along with the remains of a bone staff. According to an essay from the Gallio-Roman Museum at Tongren in Belgium, the dodecahedron was likely mounted on the staff like a kind of scepter head, and probably ascribed with magical powers, bestowing religious power and prestige on its owner. So we're looking at the top of Merlin's staff. If you go with this theory. Okay. I like it. Mm -hmm. I mean, it was found in a grave with a, someone that I had a staff. I don't know how much that makes sense, but sure, why not? I, I'm just going to go ahead and point out that it was a woman. Hmm. I was also thinking that... Um, Speaking of phase one, phase two, maybe it did have a specific use that was not that, but became decorative and then maybe became a status symbol and people use them for the tops of stabs or um, a candle holder thereafter. Um, but that was not the original use. So, <laughs> Or a windowsill decoration. Like, or <laughs> like the guy in the a windowsill <laughs> decoration for 10 years <laughs> by some bloke in London. Sure. Um, so, or perhaps they had a different kind of cultural significance. Divination or fortune telling was popular throughout the Roman Empire, and the 12 sides of the dodecahedrons could suggest a link to the astrological zodiac. The zodiac. Okay. Others have suggested that a link to Plato, who said that the dodecahedron was the shape quote used for embroidering the constellations on the whole heaven. It's not quite clear exactly what Plato was talking about. But I'm going to ask you that question. There's a lot of Plato that we're not sure what he's talking about, like Atlantis comes to mind. So, so sure, why not, Plato? Remember the quote, okay. used for embroidering the constellations on the whole heaven. Okay. So it's a sky map or a device, maybe, to view the heaven. so many options. There is. <laughs> so Rudiger Swartz, an archaeologist at Salzburg Roman Archaeological Park near Frankfurt in Germany, where Campbell first identified the curious object he had found, explains that any discussion of the cultural significance of the significance of the objects is purely speculative. We have no sources from antiquity which give an explanation of the function or the meaning of these objects, Schwartz says. Any of these theories may be true, but can neither be proved right or wrong. Schwartz points to another theory. The dodecahedrons may have been a type of masterpiece to show off a craftsman's metalworking abilities. This ah. might be why they rarely show any signs of wear. In this respect, the technical function of the dodecahedron is not the crucial point. It is the quality and accuracy of the work piece that is astonishing, he tells Mental Floss. So this is a alchemist slash blacksmith's sales piece? Mm -hmm. Like they're, you Look know, at what I can do. If I can do this, you know, then I can craft whatever you're wanting me to craft, or, you know? That's interesting. Yeah. So he goes on to say, one could imagine that a Roman bronze caster had to show his ability by manufacturing a dodecahedron, in order to achieve a certain status. Of course, the internet loves an ancient mystery, and ideas about the purpose of the Roman dodecahedrons have flourished there. So it's the final exam to get into the alchemist guild? Yeah, like it's like making a... the soup to graduate culinary school, you know? Right. You have to make the perfect soup to, you know, it's something simple, but... Complex. You need, it needs to be well-crafted, sure. you know? 
Um, I like that theory. I do too. I like that. Um, that makes sense. The um, so like like I was saying, the internet loves an ancient mystery. Um, the the work of a Dutch researcher, G. M. C. Wagmans, detailed at romandodecahedron.com proposes that the objects were astronomical instruments used to calculate agriculturally important dates in the spring and fall by measuring the angle of sunlight through the different pairs of holes. You think there would be an easier way of doing that than a dodecahedron? Because there's other cultures that, that do similar things mm -hmm. without such a complex device. Other internet researchers, perhaps less seriously, have used 3D printed models of the Roman dodecahedrons for my favorite theory of all. Okay. And I'm going to show you why um, in just a minute. So um, I'm, I don't want to spoil it, so I'm just going to gloss over that. Um, <laughs> Campbell <laughs> has taken his artifact to several museums in London, but beyond confirming what it is, they could provide no further clues about its particular origin or purpose. Many times I've handled it, wondering as its exact use, he says. While Campbell has no clear idea what the Romans were doing with the dodecahedron, which he now keeps in a display cabinet in his house, <laughs> he does propose how it might have come to be in his garden. But I, being left behind by soldiers traveling between London and the early Roman provincial capital of Camolo, uh, Camolodium, now Colchester in Essex. Go with <laughs> Colchester. Go with Colchester. Wow. I really brutalized some words. Sorry, folks. Uh, <laughs> anyway, um, so Romford was at that time a river crossing and the probable site of a fortified posting station used by Roman troops for changing horses and resting in safety. So we're going back to a military explanation for this. Um, according to the person that thinks he knows why he found it in his yard it, in Colchester. It may have been, I don't know whether it was only, I mean, he's saying that because maybe he thinks one of those military theories is but right. this is not you know, a scholarly individual no. this is just some person that yeah. found it right i mean okay. and if if military people were traveling there as a safe haven and to rest their horses then so was everybody else sure. at the time you know going from london to wherever you know or if it nowhere. was also on a merchant's row or right. merchant's road it could still be it, the alchemist slash blacksmith sales piece because it, yeah. the merchant could have dropped it um, right. On his way to market to show off his, yeah. you know, it his talents. It could have been the witch, and she dropped it <laughs> off her scepter, you know, like whatever. Um, you know, it could have been any of those people if it was a common crossing. So, I mean, he's obviously skewing it that way because that's probably what he thinks of it. So, do we know? We, I think you said we don't know definitively what it is, so there's no real solid theory. Right. Is there a theory that is upheld by more scholars or more archaeologists? No, but there is one that I love, and we're going to show it right now. All right. Here it is, folks. Let's do it. So there is a hint with the hole sizes. The holes go small, medium, large, medium, large on one side, and large, medium, large, medium, small on the other side, much like fingers do. Oh, I was going to say, so it's not a Rubik's Cube. <laughs> <laughs> right. Oh, but that's interesting. Okay. So this YouTuber created a dodecahedron in uh, with the 3D printed machine. I think you can order them online too. And basically has found a way to knit using it. And it's amazing what comes out when you use it in this fashion. So um, just a cut to the chase. Once you, there's a way that you use it with the knitting um, needle and 
you know, anybody that knows crochet or knitting will recognize, you know, kind of how this is used. Um, as you are using it, the what you're creating is going down into that particular sized hole. So it changes size by the, the size of the hole. And when you're done, it creates a pair of gloves or a glove. Wow. Okay. So the size hold, and they are perfect gloves. So someone could have used these. If you like most of the videos you see people using them, they're really slow at it because it wouldn't have been, it's not something somebody uses every day. But back then, someone would have been crafting hundreds of these as a, you know, as an, you know, someone that was making garments. And, and this goes back to, the place where they were found, which was all in the cold regions. None of the uh -huh. warmer regions. And the different sizes could be for different size sized hands. hands. And that and you'll if you if you go down to this rabbit hole in YouTube, you'll see that um, you know, people buy them in different sizes so they can make the different size finger gloves. You know? So has this craft been picked up by modern crocheters, knitters to actually do the, uh, other than this one person, is this a There's thing There's a now bunch. That... There's a bunch of videos. Like people are using them to make gloves. Oh, that's fantastic. Yeah. Because I mean, if you think about it, so technically it's a, a difficult thing to do to craft um, just with regular, you know, crocheting knitting techniques because it's, you know, it, it, it's too intricate, but this thing makes them... You'll, you'll see. That's amazing. It, yeah. You pull you it all this, out. Oh my God. An entire glove comes out. <laughs> yeah. And then you just finish off the hand part. It's crazy. Oh, that is and, fantastic. Yeah. <laughs> and I swear it has got to be this. It, this has got to be the reason. This has got to be the thing that this object was created for. If not, it works so well for that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So. That's pretty fabulous. All right. Well, that's interesting. Yeah. So I, that's going to be my theory of choice. Um, granted, that's still not the, the theory that necessarily is what it was made for. But the fact that somebody figured that out in modern times um, is pretty cool. Yeah, that's a modern genius. That's pretty crafty. Yeah. If that's not the reason, uh, that person uh, you yeah. know, deserves an award for that. <laughs> yeah. That's fantastic. So a lot of people are using them now and making gloves out of them. So Very anyway, cool. I kind of want one. <laughs> Um, all right. Mm. But anyway, well, I will leave it at that. So that was my ancient mysterious object of the week. <laughs> I love it. So many options and uh, maybe it was just a glove maker. Mm -hmm. That's pretty cool. All right. Well, um, I have one that is going to be now for something completely different. Have you ever heard of the Copper Scroll of Qumran? It sounds familiar, but I'm not I'm not getting a picture of it right off the bat. It sounded familiar to me too, and I think it may found, sound familiar to a lot of you out there. Um, and um, I'll jump right into it and tell you why. The Copper Scroll, known as 3Q15, is one of the Dead Sea Scrolls. It was found in Cave 3 near Qumran, but it differed significantly from all the other uh, scrolls. So while the others were made of parchment and papyrus, this scroll is made out of copper mixed with about 1% tin. Hmm. So, but it was found with the parchment ones? It was found in Cave 3, so there's a series oh, of oh, caves, okay. and I will put the caves up so you can kind of see them, mm -hmm. um, but the uh, the first uh, scrolls were um, discovered, and this was discovered later, but it dates back to the same time, so I'll just jump into it. Unlike the others, this is not a literary work, but a list of 64 places where various items of gold and silver were buried or hidden. What? <laughs> <laughs> so it's a treasure map. So you'd think this is one of the Dead Sea Scrolls. The Dead Sea Scrolls having to do with literary biblical matters. Mm -hmm. And here we have a copper and why copper versus 
We wanted to make sure that Papyrus lasted. or parchment, um, correct. Um, it differs from the other in its Hebrew. Um, and it differs in its orthography or the uh, capitalization, hyphenation, the word order, um, and the paleography, which is more of the study of the handwriting, uh, the way it's written, and the dating of the handwriting. So it's different, but it was created at the same time as the Dead Sea Scrolls and sound, found basically in the same location. Okay, so it wasn't written after. like Correct. So since 2013, it basically lives in the Jordan Museum in Amman, but it was discovered in Qumran, which is in Israel, so with the Dead Sea Scrolls. So a little bit of the history. Um, the Dead Sea Scrolls were founded by the Bedouins, and the Copper Scroll was discovered by an archaeologist. The scroll was on two rolls of copper, and this was discovered in March of 1952 at Cave 3 in Qumran. It was the last of 15 scrolls discovered in the cave and thus referred to as 3Q15. So I guess 15th scroll, third cave, I don't know what the Q uh, denotes. So the corroded metal cannot be unrolled by conventional means, and so the Jordanian government sent it to the Manchester University's College of Technology in England on the recommendation of English archaeologist and Dead Sea Scroll scholar John Marco Allegro, for it to be cut into sections, allowing the text to be read. He arranged for the university's Professor H. Wright Baker to cut the sheets into 23 strips between 1955 and 1956. Mm -hmm. It then became clear that the rolls were part of the same document. Allegro, who had supervised the opening of the scroll, transcribed the contents immediately. Let me ask you that. So why would it become clear that they were part of the same scrolls after they cut it apart. Well, they were in two separate rolls, if you will. And um, they were so corroded and decayed that they had to carefully uh, um, so they cut clean it and the then metal put it back together. and probably some kind of a solution, unroll it slightly, cut it, flatten the section out. And then once they pieced this all together, they realized it's not two scrolls. It's, it's one, one giant document. One. Okay, okay. I was not following that. Sorry. Go ahead. The first editor assigned for the transcription was Joseph Millick. He initially believed the scroll to be a product of the Essenes, which were um, a Jewish sect that was around during the Second Temple period at the time. Um, and he believed that due to the difference in the um, due to a difference in the paleography and the orthography, that it was basically folklore. Later, however, Millick's view changed. Since there was no indication that the scroll was a product of the Essenes from the Qumran community, he changed his identification of the scroll and now believes that it was separate from the community, although it was found at Qumran in Cave 3, and found further back in the cave away from the other scrolls. As a result, he suggested the copper scroll was a separate deposit separated by a quote-unquote lapse in time. Although the text was assigned to Millick in 1957, the Jordanian director of antiquities approached Allegro to publish the text. After a second approach by the director of Jordanian antiquities, Allegro, who had waited for the signs of Millick on moving to publish, took up the second request and published an edition with translation and hand-drawn transcriptions from the original copper segments in 1960. Millick published his official edition in 1962, also with the hand-drawn transcriptions, through the accompanying black-and-white photos, were virtually illegible. The scroll was re-photographed in 1988 with greater precision. Between 1994 to 1996, extensive conservation efforts by Electrocyte de France, and I'm going to go with that, mm -hmm. the EDF, included evaluation of corrosion, photography, x-rays, cleaning, making a facsimile, and drawing of the letters. So, skipping to the dating, it goes back and forth between any time from, let's say, initially 25 to 75 CE to 70 to 135 uh, CE, and basically after thereafter, everyone has landed on somewhere between 70 CE and 68. Uh, the reason being um, 
the last person to sort of make an evaluation on it basically had a pretty good argument, I thought. And he said the copper scrolls were behind 40 jars. So therefore, the scrolls couldn't have been placed there after the jars. And the jars date to 68 CE. So they predate that. Yeah. I mean, that makes sense. However, I mean, somebody could have crawled over the jars and put it back there to hide it. Yeah, I'm not sure the layout. But I'm thinking I mean, I'm this probably went floor to ceiling with the jars, I'm uh, imagining. Maybe, maybe. Yeah, and I know that they were large jars, so I mean, definitely wouldn't be somebody moving them around, but I, I, always, I was just thinking you could have stuck them behind the jars. But yeah, you're right. It could have just been scattered. Anyway. So the language and writing style, the orthography is unusual. The script having features resulting from being written on copper with hammer and chisel. There's also the anomaly that seven of the location names were followed by a group of two or three Greek letters. Also, the quote-unquote clauses within the scroll mark intriguing parallels to that of Greek inventories from the Greek Temple of Apollo. This similarity to Greek inventories would suggest that the scroll is, in fact, an authentic temple inventory. And where everything was. Ergo... It was an official government document detailing maybe the, I'll just go out here and jump out and say, I think they do say later, the treasures of the temple or the treasures of the kingdom or the treasures of somebody important. Mm -hmm. So based on being a literary work on papyrus and parchment, this was meant to last longer and be an official state document, if you will. Yeah. Or they believe. And so those little characters after were after each one could have been was it after each one or just some on some of them? Uh, two or three Greek letters after, and that seems very similar to the way the Greeks inventoried things. Yeah. So they, it was and like we they still were do borrowing that to this day, like cataloging things. There's usually like an inventory number or a like we look at today a SKU number or whatever on every product. Correct. Correct. So here's what's interesting: the contents. The text is an inventory of 64 locations, 63 of which are treasures of gold and silver, which have been estimated in the tons. Good. For example, one single location described on the Copper Scroll describes 900 talents. And by the way, so just some of the measures at the time, you've probably heard of a shekel. Mm -hmm. A shekel is 0.3 ounces. I think I have that right. And maybe a mina, which is around a pound today. You've heard of that. A talent, conversely, is about 66 pounds. And this scroll describes 900 talents of gold. Whoa. Yeah. So, so this is a massive inventory of that, gold. And it tells where it is? <laughs> Basically, Yeah. Uh, however, um, <laughs> spoilers, no one's found it yet. In case you're wondering, everyone, I it's was, still out there. I didn't want to jump for it, but I really did want to know the answer. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So the following English translations on the opening lines from the first column of the car Copper Scroll shows the basic structure um, of each of the entries in the scroll. And the structure is one general location, two, specific location, uh, often with a distance to the dig, and three, what to find. So if you put this in a, like a quatrain, if you will, one, one would be in the ruin that is in the valley of Acor under, one, two, the steps with an entrance at the east, one, three, a distance of 40 cubits, and we'll get into the distance of cubits in just a few. A strong box of silver and its vessels, one, four, with a weight of 17 talents. So just one of these locations details basically where to go find 17 talents of gold mm -hmm. in one of 64 locations. So this is massive. Yeah. There is a minority view that the Cave of Letters might have contributed one of the listed treasures, and if so, artifacts from this location may have been recovered. Um, however, uh, again, it has not yet. So are you ready for some of the claims of what um, yeah. you think this could be? Okay. So first, 
the treasure could be that of the Qumran community. The difficulty here is that the community is assumed to be an ascetic brotherhood, which is um, kind of like um, monk-like, if you will. They don't believe in um, the treasures of this life or accumulating personal wealth. Mm -hmm. It's about enlightenment and things like that. So uh, generally that community would have been somebody that um, was not into hoarding personal wealth. However, um, yet as a community, as opposed to an individual, wealth for a future hoped-for temple is possible. So this could have been a hoard for the coming of the new temple mm -hmm. for the community itself. And then that would be seen as okay, even for somebody that's ascetic. Right. Or this is, this is for the community, not for the individual. Right. So in whole, it still could be, but that's why a lot of people still don't think it's part of the Qumran community. Second, the treasure could be that of the second temple. However, um, one of the researchers cites Josephus as stating that the main treasure of the temple was still in the building when it fell to the Romans. And also the Qumranic texts appear to be too critical of the priesthood for the temple for the authors to have been close enough to take away the treasure for safekeeping. So there is some kind of description in some of these texts that are critical of the priesthood at the time. So it's highly unlikely that it would have been somebody that was. Yeah. I mean, that's something yeah. well known with the Dead Sea Scrolls and why a lot of them haven't really right. been revealed is because there's a lot of kind of controversial, I'll say, things in them. Um, and you would assume that the people that wrote those knew, you know, put them in the same cave that this thing was in. Right. Third, the treasure could be that of the first temple destroyed by King Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, in 586 BCE. Um, this would not, however, seem to fit with the character of the scrolls, unless perhaps the scroll was left in a cave during the Babylonian exile, possibly with a small community of caretakers who were the um, precursors to the Dead Sea Scrolls community. And then fourth, which is one of the researchers' own favorite theory, is that the treasure is a hoax. This seems very elaborate for a hoax, I'm going to say. Well, Unless I it's a diversion tactic by a community, so the Romans sacking it, let's say, would go off on this rabbit trail while the real treasure is somewhere else. Yeah, or there's no real treasure, but they... They would leave those scrolls alone and go get go look for the money or something. I don't know. Well, no, the scrolls were in front, but I mean, I could I could see that. I mean, it, it really wasn't that elaborate when you think that it was just literally a a document, and you know, as it's it's basic form. Yes, it's in metal, and that probably took a lot of time to do, but it's still you know that would make it seem more legit so I could see why they would do that even if it was a hoax. I could also see a certain community, and I'm not ascribing any sort of thing to this, I could just see anyone, let's say around that era, doing something like this to make them seem more powerful or wealthy historically. Mm -hmm. um, so if you stumble across this, then history gets written in a different way. Mm -hmm. um, that's just my own theory i'll throw that out there that's no one else's theory yeah. <laughs> anyone but i don't so. see why you really have to get too far past what it seems to obviously be which is sure. a true inventory correct now it was an inventory at that time so that money could have been used or i mean it doesn't mean that it's still wherever it was when that list was created but i mean we keep lists and in inventory now for everything right so scholars are divided as to what the actual contents are. However, metals such as copper and bronze were a common material for archival records. Among with this, formal characteristics, quote unquote, established a, quote, line of evidence that suggests the scroll is an authentic administrative document of Herod's temple in Jerusalem. Mm -hmm. So everyone is leaning towards just, if it walks like a duck, talks like a duck, it's a duck. 
it looks like an official document from the state in the way that they inventoried things was on the right metals to be preserved in the same way that everyone did it at the time. Like you just said, why look past yeah. that? As a result, the evidence has led to a number of people to believe that the treasure really does exist. And there's been several um, excavators that have tried to find this. Mm -hmm. One such person is actually John Allegro, who in 1962 led an expedition. By following some of the places listed in the scroll, the team excavated some potential burial places for the treasure. However, the treasure hunters turned up empty-handed. Thus, a treasure has yet to be found. However, there is currently the Copper Scroll Project, and you can find this... Um, with a Google search, copperscrollproject.com, led by an individual named Jim Barfield. So somebody to this very day is still trying to find it. Sure. So they are looking at it, um, and by the way, this is more of a religious excavation group. Mm -hmm. So they are going at it with uh, the intent of not only finding the treasure, but proving certain biblical things. So I'll just say, if you do, do mm -hmm. go to this site, it's going to be tinted with that sort of lens. Mm -hmm. um, however, um, part of the text indicates that the treasures are at a depth of seven cubits. And here's where I'll bring up the cubits. A cubit or seven cubits is about 12 feet. Okay, and this is the current modern excavation that's going on right now. They initially had permits to dig to a depth of two meters, but the authorities parsed this back to one meter, and in a couple of cases, only one foot. So they were never going to get down to seven cubits. Additionally, they had five approved excavation sites for their permit, and this was parsed back to three. Recent scanning activities and other tests reveal that precious metals appear around and near the areas of research from themselves and going back historically to John Allegro. Mm -hmm. So they know that some of these metals are in the ground by scanning techniques. Um, and are in the area. Uh, from their site, quote, after years of research joined with recent tests, results confirming precious metals appear in the locations identified by that research, there is strong evidence to indicate it could be the resting place from everything of the Ark of the Covenant, the Tabernacle of Moses, and the treasures of Solomon. So talk about putting all of your treasure eggs in one basket. This guy did it. <laughs> so he's thinking it could be anything from those well-known relics to just a hoard, a massive hoard of silver and gold. But who knows? Can't go past one foot or 12 feet or they can't go down to 12 feet. So he's very suspicious of why won't they let me do that? Are the authorities hiding something? So he's very conspiracy minded. He's very... Now, I do have to interject. It's a great conspiracy theory. Do the Israeli authorities, do the Jordanian government know something? But I will say, if you, and folks, if you've watched National Geographic or the History Channel enough on any of these shows, you know that permits get revoked all the time. Um, those digs in Egypt with the um, the pyramids, they the season gets cut short because the sandstorm's coming early. They have to stop digging they have to go back next year, re-permit. You know that what, happens all the time. You know what this reminds me of the most, though, with with the um, the fact that it could be could be so many different types of treasures mm -hmm. is the Oak Island stuff. Like they think For sure. everything is down in that. In that pit, like the money pit is like... Yeah, and it got there from everyone from uh, the Knights Templar to um, Blackbeard the Pirate. And who knows who put what there, but it was everybody and everything's there. Yeah. And I think that's just the mythos and the mystique around treasure hunts, mm -hmm. especially something where in an area like this, it's so there's so many crossing paths of religion, governments, at the time, empires falling and warring and crossing these areas, yeah. temples falling and rising, yeah. that, it's hey, not, why not? It could be any of this. It's not out, out of the realm of possibility. I'll put it that way. Right. So to this very day, no one knows what's there or if anything's there, but everything seems to be there <laughs> and nothing seems to be there at the same time. So that was my entry for the day. That's pretty cool. Yeah. Um, 
Yeah, so I want to hear what all the theories are out there. So what do you think the real purpose of the dodecahedron was? Do you want a 3D model of it for Christmas? I'm going to go with it is a D&D die that makes gloves. And once you make the glove, you can look through the finger hole of the glove as a sky map. Yeah, I'm just going to... going to combine them I'm going to re... I'm going to bring up that quote again that, <laughs> that was the embroidery of the all the stars in the sky I can't remember I don't have it pulled up right now but <laughs> remember that like it did have yep. it actually had a, a sewing right. uh, connotation of e. yeah. check e, <laughs> Everything. all of the above I guess you could use it for whatever you want um, yep. anyway um, and I want to hear what your theories are are there any other theories I mean there are hundreds of these found let us know where do you think the treasure is do you want to go find it? Uh, have you looked into where the locations are? Let us know in the comments below. Please like, share, and subscribe. We really could use your support as we are a growing channel. Thanks. Thank you, everybody. See you next time.